And joining us now on the debate for the full hour tonight, in the nation's capital, Andrew Jackson. That's him on the left. He's chief economist at the Canadian Labour Congress. And Doug Anderson. He's senior vice president at Harris Decima. And with us here in studio, Craig Alexander, senior vice president, chief economist with the TD Bank Financial Group. Nancy Schaefer, president at Youth Employment Services. And Andrew Langell, Toronto employment lawyer. It's good of all of you to join us here in the studio and to you guys in Ottawa. Nice to have you on the program today as well. I want to start by putting a graphic up here which really shows quite starkly the youth unemployment problem that we're going to be talking about over the course of the hour tonight. That red line is youth unemployment and there's the overall unemployment on the line below. And as you can see, youth unemployment in this country is twice as bad as it is for the general population. Now, Craig, Spain and Greece are at 50 percent, so obviously ours at 14 and change is not nearly as bad. But still, Canadian young people are facing an awful job market out there. And I want to start by asking, where have all the jobs for them gone? Well, it, it is a terrible job market. Um, and when we think about the, the youth population, they were very badly hit by the, by the recession. In fact, close to half of all the job losses in the country came on a net basis from, from, for, for individuals ages 16 to 24. Uh, they lost 225,000 jobs during the recession. And while we have seen employment rise during the economic recovery, on a net basis, only 13,000 new positions have been created since the recovery started. So this is, you know, this is a very bad labor market. It means that the unemployment rate for youth is double the national average. However, you do also need to keep it in perspective. Uh, youth, the youth segment is always hit the hardest during recessions. Mm -hmm. Uh, as, as, although we talk about, you know, you, you hear references to the Great Recession, in actual fact, youth employment was one third, it was hit one third harder during the 1990-91 recession, and the recovery was even weaker than we have today. And while the, uh, nation, while the youth unemployment rate is double the national average, uh, in actual fact, it's sitting almost exactly on its 20-year average. So the bottom line is that youths always have a bad, a bad labor market. It is true that labor market's a lot worse than it was before the recession. Unemployment rate for youths was 11.7%. Now it's slightly over 14%, so the unemployment rate has risen. Remember, though, we had a 30-year un low unemployment rate before the recession. So when we actually look at the average rate of unemployment, it's not, it's not, it's not actually different than the, the long-term average. And just clarifying, when we talk about youth unemployment, we're starting at what, age 15 to where? So for, you know, Statistics Canada basically defines it from 15, ages 15 to 20, 24. When you start thinking about international comparisons, it tends to be a bit broader. It tends to be uh, 16 to 29 is, is the usual reference. So for example, when you're talking about the conditions in the United States and in Europe. And it is very different in Canada versus, versus the other countries. It, relative to the other G7, the youth unemployment rate in Canada is dramatically lower. As you, as you already mentioned, in, in Spain, in Portugal, you're looking at 50% unemployment. In the United States, uh, it's for, for roughly the same age categories as in Canada, uh, you're talking about an unemployment rate north of 20% versus a little over 14 here. Nancy, you're with Youth Employment Services, so you've got a frontline view at what young people are trying to do to get out there and get themselves some work. What are you seeing? Well, I, uh, I like the optimism and I don't like the rosy picture that Craig painted, actually. You don't like the rosy picture? I don't picture. like the rosy picture um, that, that he's saying, comparing Canada to other countries and we're doing very well. When you say that I'm in the trenches, it's true. I run an organization. It's a not-for-profit. It's a charity. We've been around since 1968, so we've seen recessions come and go. We help thousands and thousands of young people every year at our organization. And I can tell you that I'm speaking for these young people. It is not a bad labor market. It's a terrible labor market for young people. No, but it's not 50% like Spain. He's saying everything's relative. Everything is relative, but if you're, if you're going to a hospital and you can't breathe or you're having a heart attack and they tell you, oh, but this gentleman next to you uh, has got a worse heart attack, you're fighting for your life. So that comparison, I don't feel, is really fair. Cold I think comfort. I think that we have to look at Canada and look what we can do for our young people because we hear every day that whether they're haven't finished whether they finished high school haven't finished high school whether they've completed university it's taking them longer and longer to get gainful employment and it's a serious serious situation so i i am not here to point a rosy picture i'm here to speak on behalf of young people who can't get a job today and, and want to know why okay you're wearing a red shirt andrew is wearing a red patch and for those who don't know do you want to explain what that red patch refers to well, it's to, to show solidarity with uh, the students in Quebec who are challenging the government. So you're with them? Yes. 
spiritually anyway. What are you finding out there? Well, a number of things. Uh, you know, young people are you know, facing the prospect of having to develop a, you know, a career with only a, a temporary stream of uh, precarious jobs. Uh, that's number one. Um, you know, two, they're facing increasing economic insecurity and they're having problems building a life uh, that their parents knew and their grandparents knew. And uh, that's uh, a big problem. Third, um, you know, there's a need to pursue higher and higher levels of qualification um, you know, with a high cost. Uh, you know, fourth, um, they don't have access to the same entitlements that previous generations had. And uh, five, you know, when you get into other issues, uh, the high cost of housing in urban centers, uh, you know, tuition fees, you know, having to service debt, uh, you know, it, it's a perfect storm in the labor market and in uh, the wider society that are impacting young people. Okay, let's, go to, uh, let's go to Doug in Ottawa if we can. And Doug, I, I don't know if you've got surveys that, uh, that focus particularly on young Canadians to find out who they blame but do you have any sense about who young people blame for the fact that uh, the jobs aren't there for them today as they may have been when times were better, obviously? Well, I, I can't point to any stats that will tell us who they're blaming uh, for the situation that, uh, that faces youth today. But uh, I have got some you know, contextual trends that, uh, that we've looked at. Um, and I can say that there are tougher times today than in you know many points in time in the last 30 40 years <clears throat> but not the toughest times and i would also add that uh some of the issues that uh, that we're dealing with are uh are complicated by a increasingly global situation and the solutions um become more problematic as a result of now facing competition from uh, baby boomers that are staying around in jobs, you know, partly because they enjoy their job, perhaps, partly because uh, they've got financial situations that require them to continue working, uh, partly because uh, the you know, uh, retirement age has been raised. Uh, well, I guess that doesn't take effect just yet. Uh, but regardless, there's a, there's a conspiring set of factors that are contributing to the challenge they have, but it's not a challenge that is really new to this generation. That's uh, not to be insensitive to the fact that, you know, our kids are going through this kind of challenge. My oldest son is going to be facing that in just a few years, and he's kind of stressed about it too. Hmm. Andrew Jackson, let me bring you in at this point, because one of the other reasons we often hear that there aren't jobs available for young people is that when the economy goes sour, and particularly in a unionized environment, it's the last in is the first out. And I wonder whether the union movement feels at all bad about the fact that those workplace rules often result in young people kind of not being able to get their, their dibs in on that first job, or if they do get it, they're out the door pretty quickly thereafter. Well, I think it's much broader than that, Steve. I, I mean, I think in any recession, uh, young people do feel the, the brunt of the, the lack of demand for, uh, for workers. And, you know, it's lack of new hiring uh, that really drives up the unemployment rates. And I think the sad fact of the matter is that when push comes to shove, most employers will... Uh, well, when there's more workers looking for a job than they have jobs to offer, they'll choose those with the, uh, the most uh, experience. And there were a lot of unionized workers who lost uh, their jobs in the recession, who settled for much worse jobs than they had uh, previously, and, and preempted, I think, uh, entry-level workers. And the other big impact of the recession was the, uh, the loss of retirement savings. We now have one in four people aged 65 to 70 who are still in the workforce. Uh, well up from uh, a few years ago and a lot of those older workers are now taking jobs in retail trade sales and service jobs the kind of jobs that that young people used to take as entry-level jobs so I, I think you know the big factor is they, they bear the brunt of the fact that uh, the overall demand for labor in, in Canada is uh, is uh, doesn't match the number of people looking for for work I think if it might, we could come back to it, but I, th I think another s smaller factor here at play is, the, uh, is really the lack of fit between the, uh, the skills young people are, are gaining in the educational system and those that are demanded in the economy. And I, th I think there's, there's ways of addressing the youth unemployment by, uh, by raising the skills of young people and, and trying to get them to where the jobs 
will be we're going to spend moving forward. Yeah, we're going to spend more time on, on some solutions and some ideas as we go along, but I still want to identify the problem a little more as we start here. Nancy, let me put this to you. I, according to the stats that I've seen, almost a million Canadians aged 15 to 29 are neither in school or at work. And I gather in Europe they call these folks NEETS, N-E-E-T-S, not in education, employment, or training. Do you worry that we run the risk here in Canada, admittedly not as bad as in some European countries, but still, by our standards, not good enough? Do we run the risk of creating a permanent underclass of NEETS in this country? Yes, absolutely. And I mean, that's a very a nice way of saying N-E-E, -E, NEET, for young people. But really, it's unemployed young people. They're not in school. They're not employed, so what are they doing? You have to ask yourself, if they're not in school and they're not working, what are they doing? Are they doing anything productive with their time? And of course, there's always that risk. Now, I say it's a risk because no one's got a crystal ball and can say, we're going to lose this generation of kids. But this generation of kids is facing a, a very rude awakening around their future. And Andrew brought up the student protest in Quebec. We've seen that most movements, whether they're radical or peaceful, are led by young people. And they are frustrated right now. They don't know why you started off by saying, uh, where have the jobs gone? Well, I don't know if any of us can really, really know that. I certainly don't know where the jobs have gone. But uh, I do know that we should be doing more about it. Who's and so the we? You say we should be doing more. Who's we? Well. Of course, the, the we is a general we. The country should do more. And I'm going to, our leaders of this country are our government and our corporate sector and business, businesses. Okay, let me break that up for a second here. Craig, if, if, let's start with government. We know that the government of Ontario has decided, in its words, to bring in a much more austere set of spending programs going forward. The federal government doesn't like to use the word austerity, but it's also cutting back as well. Mm -hmm. How much of that accounts for the fact that young people today can't get work? Well, if we think about the Canadian economy as, as a whole, it's growing at about 2% per year, and the fiscal austerity is slowing down growth by about half a percentage point. So that doesn't, that doesn't sound like much, but you're, you're talking about a, still a significant drag on the economy, and it will feed through to, to, to slower employment growth. It probably means that as we look forward that the rate of economic growth um, probably will not be strong enough to lead to a material decline in the unemployment rate. So in terms of this conversation, you know, I would suggest that a year from now, we probably will be having the same youth unemployment rate that we basically have today. So this again brings up why this is so relevant. And, you know, as you said, um, there, there is an enormous number of vulnerable young people. I didn't mean to actually give a, a, an a overly optimistic assessment of what, what the state of affairs are, uh, but I also don't want to over, overly sensationalize it. I mean, the youths, face, youths are facing a much tougher labor market than they were in 2007. But we also need to keep it, keep it in perspective. A good example of that is the you know, 904,000 that are in the NEAT category, as you described it. Um, one of the things that didn't get as much airplay was that that number uh, as a share of the youth population hasn't actually changed over the last 10 years. And so it, it is, it, the NEAT category does not seem to be a product of a great recession that created a lost generation. And in fact, I think one of the things that's shaping our dialogue is a lot of the media uh, concerning what's going on in the United States. I, I, not that long ago, I was in uh, southern Ontario and I was visiting a national park and there was two uh, Canadian youths there and they were having this conversation about being part of the lost generation. So I actually went and challenged them on it to try and get a sense of where they were getting their perception from. And it was because the dialogue we're having about this generation being a lost generation. I don't actually think it is a lost generation. I think they're facing tough labor market conditions. I think it's going to be harder to find work. But what we also know from the official statistics is that only 14% of the 14.5% that are unemployed are actually experiencing long-term unemployment of more than six months. So in other words, it is a very tough labor market. We probably need to do more to support our use, and we should be doing that regardless of the economic circumstances. Andrew, Langell, how much of the difficulty youth may be having getting work today, do you think, is attributed to the fact that governments are cutting back? Well, you know, you look at what provincial or federal governments are doing in Canada, and it's a full-on attack on this generation. It's a full-on attack of this generation. Yes. He, ju he just said, stop with the uh, exaggeration and with the um, sensationalizing of headlines. 
and then you've just called it a full-out attack on this generation? Well, let me break it down. <laughs> okay. You have changes to the EI system uh, that the Conservative government is doing. Uh, you know, a lot of people were looking for more wholesale reform that would help young people. Uh, okay. young, That's young not people, an attack on this generation. Well, if it's young, an attack young, at young, all, it's on young, everybody. Well, young people can't even access EI for the most part because they're in precarious temporary jobs that don't meet the criteria. Okay, for, but where's for, the attack on this generation? Well, let's, let's move on to some other uh, points. Uh, changes to CPP, raising the retirement age. You know, that's going to have a cumulative impact over you know, the long run. Um, slashing summer uh, student job centers. That was another initiative uh, that was erased. Uh, the end of mandatory retirement um, you know, in keeping older workers in uh, the labor market for much longer periods of time. And, and Craig referenced uh, that more people were staying in the workforce to bolster retirement savings. You know, that's something okay. that, we're, that, that go, we're seeing. Let me uh, go to Andrew Jackson on that then. Does that sound, would you agree with that checklist insofar as does it sound to you like a full out attack on this generation? Well, I think there's a full out attack on, uh, on workers generally and I, I think young people are disproportionately experiencing the, the impacts of that. Uh, I mean, I, th I think a, a big factor here though is the uh, is the, uh, the difference in experience between the baby boomers and their children. And I, I don't think it's a conspiracy of baby boomers that they're, they're staying in the workforce longer. It's the result of the erosion of, uh, of pensions, uh, the fact that a lot of people uh, lost their jobs in the recession, have struggled to find new jobs. Um, but I, I think sort of looking at it in terms of conflicts between generations is, is not the best way of looking at it. It's, um, it, it's, it's really, I think, what, what we do about the issue. And I, th I think sort of putting the focus on job creation generally would sort of really help. I'm, I'm less fatalistic about this than Craig is. But I think there's some very concrete measures that can be taken to assist young people. Well, one thing I find striking compared to the past is if we look at things like summer job creation programs, work creation programs uh, for young people trying to give students some work experience as they as they go through the educational system, you know, which is really important in terms of a transition to work. But support for a lot of those programs is at very, very low levels. So that the youth employment strategy of the federal government uh, basically provides opportunities for about one and a half percent of all, of all young people. That's a pretty trivial sort of intervention relative to the scale of the problem. Hmm. So I agree with Craig. I mean, it's going to be a while till we get out of this situation, but I, I think there's things we can be doing now to to stop the, the worst of the impacts uh, you know, falling on a, a relatively uh, small group of young people. And let's face it, people who are unemployed for two, three years in their you know, late teens, early 20s really do risk being scarred for life by that experience. They'll, they'll likely never get into the, the workforce on the same terms and conditions. Okay, as, let, me as get Cra let me get Craig Alexander, and then I want to hear Doug Anderson on this as well. Craig? Um, in terms of the, 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 the potential risks from government austerity, um, the one thing I would say that we really do need to be very careful about as we go through this process of fiscal rebalancing is that we don't underinvest in education. Because ultimately the, the greatest determinant in terms of getting you know, a, a good paying job and, and, having, and, and having a big impact on your standard of living is how much education you get. And when we think about what happened in the mid-90s when we went through the deficit fighting of that period, uh, there was an enormous uh, strain put on the education system as the federal government cut transfers to the provinces, as provinces cut transfers to universities and, and colleges. Uh, it had a really detrimental impact on, on, the edu on, on the educational system. And we saw the legacy of that for close to 10 years. And so one of the things we absolutely have to ensure, like when, you, when we talk about, you raised the question of how much you know, fiscal austerity is this going to hurt youths. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, in my mind, it's a very tough labor market for those that have just entered the labor market, but probably my biggest worry when it comes to fiscal austerity is underinvestment in education because I think it'll have a longer lasting impact on, on the Canadian economy and the prospects for youths. Doug Anderson. Uh, well, I have to totally agree with uh, what Craig just said there. Um, that's exactly where, uh, where my interpretation would go. Um, uh, I would also agree that it's, it's probably not uh, as helpful as, as we might want to pit one side against another and describe it as a full-on attack, uh, I wouldn't go there. I would 
give more uh, credence to uh, all of us involved in society to really identify this as a, as a problem that needs to be addressed and how we go about doing it we can disagree upon. And, um, you know, I don't play the role of a public policy maker so I don't get to make those decisions but I can at least, you know, respect that maybe some of these changes do affect uh, youth disproportionately and, and, and some don't but it's not how do we, uh, you know, attack one part of society uh, in preservation of another. So I don't think that's terribly helpful, and I don't really think that's what's going on. I think that, uh, you know, focusing on investing in the ways that we can make those who are unemployed uh, productive in the workforce uh, as soon as possible is uh, exactly the way to go about doing it, and, uh, and I would encourage those kinds of policies. I, I think that uh, those prove to be the uh, successful ones, and um, maybe, you know, and, highlighting those kinds of programs is the way to ensure that there isn't the tension between generations that, uh, uh, you know, that this might be generating. And then sell newspapers. Nancy. Well, uh, what I'm hearing of, uh, from young people is coming out of school with huge student debts. So they, they have got the message that staying in school is important and getting more education will lead to a better job and, and future potential earnings. Um, but they know very well that they're going to come out with a lot of debt and their job prospects are minimal. And so, I th whereas I, ag I agree, I think we have to focus on the economy, and that's where expenditures come in. So it's not helpful, fiscal restraint. I think we should be encouraging people to spend, to get the economy moving again, whether it's our government spending or individual spending. We've got to create jobs for, for young people. And uh, that might be contrary to popular opinion, but we're certainly feeling in our organization, I mean, we're in the trenches and we help kids find jobs and we, we can't help enough of them, whether it's summer jobs or all year round. And we are under major fiscal restraint. So I do want to say that our, both our federal government and our provincial government have programs for young people, but they've been downsized and chopped and re and transformed. And, but it is an assault ultimately on the help that can be provided to young people. I'm not sure it's contrary to pu pu popular opinion, but it's certainly contrary to the opinion of finance ministers who are calling the shots on this, right? Yes, and, and you know, I had a question uh, asked me about why don't young people vote? Why aren't they out there voting? And I'd say, well, why, aren't, why isn't everybody out there voting? I mean, very, you know, a majority of our population doesn't vote, it, their voice isn't heard, and young people take that as a cue and they go, well, why should I vote anyway? I mean, um, what, what, what good is it going to do? But they do turn to the streets when they want to protest, as we've seen in Occupy Toronto, as we've seen in the student movement in other countries. And I certainly don't, I for one, don't want our young people to get that frustrated where they feel their country is not for them. So I don't think fiscal austerity is an, an appropriate uh, way to go. Well, let's, let me follow up with that last comment with Doug. Uh, it, I, I guess, you know, the negotiations between the students in um, in Quebec and the Chere government have broken down after a few days of face-to-face of -face talks. Can you tell where public opinion is on that? I know there's a lot of sympathy for, for young people today because they can't get that first job, need experience to get a job, can't get a job without experience. But what, do, what does public opinion tell you about whether people like what's been going on in the streets over the last hundred plus days? Well, the, the situation in Quebec, it's, it's remarkable in terms of uh, how opinion actually has, has been fluctuating in, uh, in terms of what I've been seeing anyhow. Uh, you know, people started off um, feeling more or less like, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's a tough situation for students, and, um, but the economic realities say that the money for schools have to come from somewhere, and, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, it's finally time to um, raise tuitions over a number of years. Um, and uh, so I think there was some general, certainly even outside of Quebec, uh, it became a national issue and our numbers were showing that outside of Quebec it was even uh, that people were more accepting of that. And uh, uh, the protest didn't, um, didn't particularly help uh, the student position. Um, in terms of building sympathy, it uh, was, was probably destructive for them, but then uh, I suspect that with the um, Bill 78, I believe it was, that uh, was passed with the uh, new rules um, about uh, public gatherings, um, I think that that's actually probably uh, turned the compass around again and now made people feel a little bit more likely uh, to say, okay, both sides need to maybe uh, take a deep breath and, uh, and deal with this thing in a more mature manner and calm manner and uh, see if we can come to some resolution. And uh, the recent 
um, talks. Uh, what I, I was struck yesterday when I saw that they had broken down over, uh, well, I don't know what the cause was, but uh, certainly saw a talk about uh, festivals might be targeted and, and thought that probably isn't the way to, to get the public back on side at this point. And, okay, uh, I want to follow up on, on Nancy's we. You mentioned we've got to do something about this. And to that end, I want to read something here that was on CBC News Post from a, about a week or so ago. Nearly 75 million young people around the world are without jobs, an increase of more than 4 million since the year 2007, the International Labor Organization reports. In a study released this week, the ILO says there is little to suggest the trend will improve over the next four years. Canada is not immune from the global trend. A report by TD economist Francis Fong released in March suggested the economic recovery has been, quote, almost non-existent for young Canadians who face challenging job prospects for several more years, even as older workers have been flooding into the job market and getting work. Let's pick up on the we. Craig, whose responsibility is it to deal with this? Everyone's. I mean, at the end of the day, I think that there is a role for government to play because I do think that education and skills training is a core part of the uh, a part of building the, the, the human capital that we need. And so, you know, in terms of employability, you can see that employability is directly correlated to the amount of education you get. Uh, I think that uh, businesses have a role to play in terms of valuing the skills that, that, that young people have. Can't force anybody to hire anybody, though. But, no, you can't. And, you know, at the end of the day, it, it, we are a product of the international environment that we're in. The global economy is still struggling. Much of the problems for, can for the Canadian economy actually lie outside of our borders. You know, if you want to know, you know, in terms of the, what are going to be some of the key determinants to the Canadian economic strength and job prospects, well, it's going to be the strength of the U.S. economy, which regrettably Canada doesn't really have any influence over. Mm. Uh, a lot will determine on how Europe deals with its fiscal crisis and, and whether they can contain, contain it, uh, which is, again, outside the scope of our ability to influence it. Uh, businesses will basically hire labor on the basis of what they expect for future demand and the, and the need for workers to fill those positions. Um, so I do think that you know, businesses can play a role in, in, in championing young people when they have vacancies and trying to get past a little bit, past that, that, that chicken and egg problem of you know, no experience, no job, no job, no experience, um, recognizing potential. Um, at the end of the day, though, there's also a role for individual Canadians to play, particularly the, the young people, to keep looking and keep trying. Right? One of the reasons why I was trying to emphasize the fact that, that the unemployment situation is bad, but it's not a lost generation, is because you don't actually want the generation to lose heart and give up, because that actually fuels the problem by creating even more discouraged workers. So let's get some ideas here. Nancy, some creative solutions, some creative solutions rather, to who the we is, and what they should do? Well, in our province of Ontario, we have many, well, we, we call ourselves service providers, those that actually work with young people, and we're employment agencies, so we have a network, and we, ha we have a few tools in our toolkit that we know helps. And one of the things that helps is when you have a young person with a certain skill set and they want to do a certain job, we work with employers. So yes, we work with youth, but we also work with employers. And we say to them, if you'll take on this young person and train them, we can give you a stipend or we can help pay for that training, period. Where do you get your money from? Uh, that money comes from several sources. It comes from government grants. It's, we're a charity, so we do fundraising. And it comes from fee-for-service contracts we have. So it comes from a variety of sources. And what's your annual budget? Our annual budget is six million. And six we, million bucks. So, and we serve uh, seven th over seven thousand young people a year, uh, at what an average cost of fifteen hundred dollars to get them a hmm. job. But that's no substitute for a good made in Ottawa or made at Queens Park youth employment strategy, is it? Well, no. But I mean, some of these ideas. I mean, I, I want to talk about partnership here. But you asked me, um, what are some creative solutions? Because when an employer is looking at a young person, they'll say, well, why should I take you? You don't have any training, you're not experienced, and this person over here does. And we, one of the tools we use, but yes, this young person brings uh, new energy, new creative ideas, and if we help cover your training costs, then that alleviates some of the risks. And they begin to listen to this. Does that this work is, as a pitch? Oh, it does work as a pitch, absolutely. That's just one of the things, but you have to, it, we have to fund that kind of effort. But there's a win-win, because the employers are winning and the young people are winning. But I want to go back to something Craig said about creative solutions, is that we can't assume that young people 
have the skill to find a job. We assume that our school should, they sh we should graduate mm. these perfect human beings, that they've got their education, and they should come out and they should be, know how to find a job. Well, they don't. And why should they? I mean, when they're in school, it's irrelevant to learn about how to, how to find a job. It's very competitive these days. One of the things that we have to focus on is getting them as competitive as the next person. So they'll say to us, how do I write a sophisticated resume when I've only had summer jobs? How do I use social media to create opportunities for myself? Can I jump in on this here? Sure. The older generation already thinks the younger generation has been coddled enough by helicopter parents who have never said a negative thing to these kids in their lives because they don't want to you know, adversely affect their self-esteem. And now we're going to say, you don't even have to go look for the job yourself. We're going to help you find it because you poor little folks don't know how to do it. Well, now, I'm exaggerating for effect here, but you know what I'm saying? No, I, I repeat your question again. Well, Steve. I'm basically saying, you know, you say these kids don't know how to look for a job. Every generation prior to this generation seems to have learned how to go out there and find a job. Yeah. Uh, well, how come I, this generation doesn't know? Not in this environment. Not in this environment. I want to correct you there. And also, who, what young people are you talking about when you say coddled? I mean, are you talking about young people who are from backgrounds of poverty and of single not. parents? Of are you talking not. about university grads whose parents are earning two, three hundred thousand dollars? Yes. So you, you can't just say youth. You have because. But even those the folks demographics are quite different, and we have to keep this in mind. Okay. Ottawa wants in, and then Andrew Langell wants in. Andrew Jackson, was that you I heard trying to get in earlier? Yeah, well, I think one aspect of this, Steve, is, is, is how the educational system relates to the world of work. And I mean, I think the underlying problem is we have six unemployed workers out there for every job vacancy that exists. So it's going to be tough for anybody to get work. But what, one, one aspect of this issue is that th there are, in, certainly in some occupations in this country, in some parts of the country, there are skill shortages. And I think we're doing a lousy job of, uh, of ensuring that young people can get into the, uh, the programs that give them the skills they need to, uh, to take those jobs. So for example, I mean, it has been argued in the past that young people just weren't interested in the skilled trades where we know those jobs. The fact of the matter is there are just not the places available in, in the colleges for the, the young people who are trying to get in to take those, uh, those programs. So it, there's about a, a two, three year wait, I'm told, in Nova Scotia to get into a, a program to become an electrician. Um, so even if you know, young people know where they want to go, they know what skill sets they need, being able to get that can be very, uh, very, very problematic. Uh, apprenticeship programs. I mean, there's a real problem there, young people who get into them. The problem is if they lose the job, they, they're unable to complete the apprenticeship program. There are creative ways of dealing with that if we get groups of employers together that when a, a young person loses a job with one employer, that a group of employers can make sure that they're allowed to continue the training. So I, I think there, there are some ways of improving the, the pathways that we have to jobs that, that do exist. Uh, you know, over and above the, the overall problem that there are just too few jobs for the number of people looking your, for them. Your fellow namesake in But I wouldn't blame in. young people for not looking for jobs very actively, for not uh, trying to seek the education and qualifications that they need to fit into the, the job market. I, I, it, I just don't see this as a cultural thing at all. I think it's the basic problem is uh, we still have high unemployment and underemployment in Canada. And l let's not forget, there's a lot of young people who want full-time jobs, have settled for part-time jobs, anything that they can find because sure. they're so eager to get into the workforce. Okay, Andrew Langell. Well, well I really want to ch challenge the, the idea that young people today are coddled. Um, well, some of them are, Andrew. Well, well, yeah, perhaps, but I'm, I'm sure some people from your generation were coddled as well. Sure, some of uh, them were. <laughs> You know, the thing is, it's like w w when you see, uh, you know, students coming out of, you know, law schools, uh, teachers' colleges, medical schools, who, who can't find jobs in, in great numbers, and that's uh, the situation that in Ontario, one really wonders what's going on. And I, I think this goes back to a question about, you know, does government in Canada have the capacity to address these issues? And, you know, when you have issues in the teachers' colleges with, them producing, you know, vast uh, numbers of graduates, uh, you know, without any jobs, one wonders why the government would engage in a, a strategy like that. And, you know, it goes to, you know, the competence of who's running our civil service. Uh, you know, and I think that's a big issue. Let me follow up on that, because that's an interesting point. I don't know who, who wants in on this, but 
the fact is there are journalism schools all over this country. I'll take one example of something I know a little bit about. There are journalism schools all over this country that are urging students, if you want to be a reporter for the Toronto Star or whatever, come, get your degree, you'll get out there, you'll be perfectly, you know, eligible and qualified to have one of those kind of jobs, which coincidentally are all disappearing anyway. Uh, are we doing, I don't know who wants to, uh, Nancy won on this? Or, I mean, are yeah, we, like are, to, yes, I mean, I, 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 see, these, yeah, I are, see these kids every day. In fact, I've counseled a few around journalism. So are we miseducating them for jobs that no well, longer but exist? What are you going to tell your kids? Follow your passion and where your skills are or get your education for where the jobs are? I mean, that's another philosophical question, which I don't think that we should really discuss today. But we have a number of young people with those degrees in journalism, but what's happening to them? It's part-time work, it's free work, it's piecemeal, and they're bringing a lot to the workforce, but there's a, their employers aren't treating them respectfully. Now you could argue, perhaps, that well, their employer doesn't have the money. Well, I say let's create the money so that when young people follow their passion and, and journalism, that there aren't these, you know, there's no benefits on these jobs, and I've been, I've seen lots of them. And it's very discouraging for them. And they question every day, Steve, should I give up my dream job? Should I give up that dream of doing something I want? And we say it, yes, that no, you shouldn't. And you keep persevering. I mean, things, things will change. So that's my answer to, you know, OK, um, let me get Doug Anderson to follow up on that as well. Doug? Oh, thanks. Um, actually, I think that's, uh, that's a very helpful point. And one thing I wanted to add is that it, Every part of society, whether we're talking about the public policy decision makers, the educators, uh, the employers or the students themselves, or parents perhaps, uh, we all have a role to play, as, uh, as Craig had said earlier. And uh, there are certain constraints um, at any given point in time. Right now, that's, there's two financial constraints that are, that are affecting whether there are jobs, whether there is money for jobs. And one of them is the uh, you know, global economic situation, and Canada has been relatively fortunate, uh, but that's really just not being quite as unfortunate as other parts of the world. Um, and another part is, uh, is our own, uh, you know, fiscal uh, houses, uh, whether municipally, provincially, federally, um, is, you know, the, the, the pressure to keep those in order and, and try not to spend in ways that uh, might not be as constructive. And so there's, there's that money pressure at play. But one thing I think we're forgetting about is that you know, when students go to school, I did, um, uh, we all sort of pursued our passion and uh, sometimes we were lucky and found that passion could be directly applied at the first job we got or other times we had to root around a little bit and try something different and maybe adapt and maybe innovate and maybe, um, you know, tack another skill set on uh, to what we came out of university with, if that's the path that we took in order to pursue something close to our passion and, and find satisfaction that way. Okay, I, Doug, let me go I, out I on a... I would want people to be patient. Let me go out on a tangent with this one to the guy beside you. Andrew, you know, most, a lot of businesses do unpaid internships, right, as a way of sort of getting a foot in the door, getting some experience, mm -hmm. uh, but obviously you're not making any money. Uh, is that a good idea? Does that contribute to the situation? What's your view on that? I have mixed feelings on that, frankly. I, I, I think it, it, it can be exploitative. Uh, you know, that said, there's a, there's a lot of organizations will take placements of students and, I, you know, I think put some effort into, uh, into making it a, a useful experience p for people and, and not necessarily have the resources to, to pay people. I, I think one danger in that is that it, uh, it, it really uh, gives uh, additional benefits to middle class, upper income, uh, children whose parents can afford to support them while they go off on a world of un unpaid internships and uh, students from more modest circumstances will you know take the jobs in McDonald's to sort of pay the bills at school so it's a, it's another uh, you know unequalizing way of going about it. Um, I'm repeating myself but I, I, I think the... Uh, well don't do that because we're running out of time here. here. I gotta, I gotta keep it fresh. Strategy. <laughs> Sorry, okay, hang well, on. the youth employment strategy of governments does provide financial support to employers to pay those kinds of, uh, create those kinds of work experience opportunities, but, you know, funding for those programs is, has really dried up, is incredibly modest. Okay, I, I wanna, think that is a role for government. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I want to read something here. Craig, I'm coming to you on this one because, I, I don't know, were you in on this meeting? Let's see. 
Minister of Finance Jim Flaherty met with Canada's leading private sector economists, of whom, Craig, you are one, to gather their views on economic prospects for the country. The economists confirmed the government's economic planning assumptions remain on track. Our top priority continues to be the economy, said Minister Flaherty. With the economic recovery still fragile, we must remain focused on creating jobs and economic growth while balancing the budget in the medium term. Two questions. Were you in on that meeting? Yes. How'd it go? Um, I, it was basically one of a pragmatic view of the outlook, which is slow growth, low inflation, low interest rates for the foreseeable future with a very difficult international backdrop. Any chat about youth unemployment in that meeting? Uh, there was an awful lot of chat, uh, there was an awful lot of conversation around jobs, which is something the government's been very clear about in terms of, on the one hand, they want to rebalance their, their finances over the next sort of three to five years, over the medium term. And at the same time, they, they want to try and pr provide support to the, to the labor market to the best ability. Jim Flaherty asked you why businesses are not hiring more people these days? I think the government has a lot of frustration that corporations are sitting with vast amounts of cash on their balance sheets. Which and they it, are. Which they are. And if, the, if that money was deployed, it not only could it create an awful lot of investment and in productivity and enhancing machinery and equipment, but it also could create an awful lot of employment. And the reason why businesses are not using that cash and deploying it is because they're scared. Of what? They're scared about the economic environment. They're scared that there could be a financial calamity. And quite frankly, those fears are justified by what's happening right now in Europe. Um, I know it seems like a very far, you know, very far away. But if the European leaders lose control over this fiscal crisis and you have several countries default on their debt, you could easily cause a, a banking crisis in Europe. And if that happened, you could easily create an environment like we had after Lehman Brothers failed in 2008. And I'm honestly, I am not sensationalizing this. It could be worse than in 2008. Because instead of having one government dealing with one banking system, you would have 17 governments dealing with 17 banking systems, and many of those governments have enormous fiscal challenges, so they could not provide support to their, their banking system. So when Flirty says to you, why aren't you creating more jobs, you tell him this, and he says what? Well, I'm not the one creating them, but I tell him that from an economic point of view, Here's businesses why. are holding back because they don't know what's going to happen. Okay, Nancy? And what's that's precisely my point. Um, the federal government didn't hold back when we entered into this last financial crisis. They were... Uh, they, had, they gave corporate loans, there was bailouts, they saved um, auto worker jobs and so on. So they have the ability to respond and respond quickly. When they want to. When they want to. On, and, and I feel very badly for young people who at this time are, are feeling what is the country doing about jobs for young people. And the, there's things that they can do, whether the, the banks uh, you know, there's this whole risk mentality and restraint. I don't think is very is an encouraging economic model for our young people. Andrew, well, j just to follow up on uh, Craig's comments, it, it would seem that uh, youth unemployment is not a priority of uh, Minister Flaherty and uh, Prime Minister Harper, and uh, you know it's incumbent on them to make it a priority. If businesses are not going to be hiring young people, then government has to intervene and do something do about the situation. Do you see it as a priority for the McGuinty government in Queens Park? No. It's, you know, it's not a priority for any government. For no government? No. What would you like to see? No. We, we can uh, look at active labor market strategies, um, you know, where governments, like, create jobs through, Do, you know... Direct government spending to create jobs. Well, you know, um, short-term, um, you know, subsidies for, for jobs, uh, better, um, you know, employment services, uh, you know, across the country. You could have, you know, better labor market information be made available to people. You know, right now, it's very difficult to get, um, you know, solid information on uh, what's out there. But when you hear what Craig had to say about how nervous corporate Canada is right now, and therefore that's why they won't spend money to create jobs, do you accept his explanation? No. Well, how can you not? Well, you know, what, what are you saying is, uh, you know, it's like, oh, doom and gloom, doom and gloom, you know, we can't do anything about it. And the government's taking that as a carte blanche not to engage in spending. The problem is when we think about Ontario that the credit rating agencies have basically put a gun up against their head and said, you will rebalance your fiscal policy because you cannot go any further than you already, already are. 
we're downgrading you now. We could downgrade you further if you don't show that you can apply fiscal restraint. So the, the fact of the matter is the government doesn't have the ability to endlessly print money and just throw it at the problems. I do think there are things that the government can do within their, within their budget constraint. I do think they, there's things governments can do even when they are doing fiscal austerity. I think your idea of more labor market information is an extremely important one. I think having, I think having uh, high schools uh, prepare the students better for what the labor market looks like, making sure that they are, they do understand when you take choices between journalism or engineering, you know, there's a different, there's a different outcome at the end in terms of job prospects and income. That doesn't mean you shouldn't follow your passion and be the next, uh, you know, journalism star down the road. If it's your passion, chase it. But for heaven's sakes, understand the risks that you're taking in terms of the choices you're making. And I think universities and colleges can do better in terms of helping helping place their, their, their students with the labor market. Andrew Jackson, did I hear you trying to get in? Well, two points. I mean, I, I think governments could at least uh, stop making things worse. And I mean, the federal government in this downsizing exercise, I mean, one thing you can be sure of, there's not going to be any p young people hired by the federal government over the next two or three years. That's, that's probably true in Ontario as well. It's probably true across much of the broader public sector. I mean, one could sort of, you know, try and keep a, a, a sort of new labor force retention uh, or hiring going on through that process. I, I know that's difficult to, uh, in a downsizing process, but uh, but in, otherwise, I mean, it is young people coming into the system bearing the burden of austerity the most. Uh, the uh, the temporary employees of, of governments who tend to be young people are the first to let go. So that's one area where governments can act. And frankly, I, I can't resist just jumping in and saying that, uh, you know, as, as Craig said, when, when companies are sitting on a lot of cash, uh, and that's uh, you know, you know being boosted by corporate tax breaks that have contributed to those deficits. I mean, there are choices governments can make, and one is to uh, to have fewer tax cuts and uh, and less austerity on the on the public uh, spending side. We didn't have to cut the GST by two percentage points, which has contributed to the federal government fiscal problem. So, I mean, I I, I don't think we just uh, can accept the notion that the only alternative right now is is fiscal austerity. And, you know, as Krugman and others argue, maybe we'd end up in a better place with a more growth-oriented strategy, both in terms of the jobs, but also in terms of the sustainability of, of government finances. Nancy Schaefer. I want to just say two things, Steve. You, you know, you mentioned about um, uh, the lack of money. I don't think this planet has ever seen so much money. I mean, we have billionaires, and we have a billion billionaires. Maybe not a billion billionaires, but we have a lot of or billionaires. So, much debt. so um, but I also wanted, we talked about ideas around how we can get out of this. We, uh, yes, we run a business center where young entrepreneurs, those who don't want, who can't find jobs, are turning to their own ideas to create businesses. And you, you see the, the, the energy and the innovation that young people bring to our labor market, whether it's green industries or their own home cottages or the passion, I mean, sorry, fashion, because Toronto is a fashion incubator uh, city. They bring lots of new ideas. So the jobs that are here today aren't going to be the jobs of the future. And so we need our young people. Um, bringing those new ideas and that energy and if the banks would help fund uh, some of these young people with businesses ideas and more support for that I think that's a great idea to help this country emphasis on entrepreneurship and let's get those ideas for the future labor market is it tougher than ever now if you're a young person with an idea for a new job to get that to a reality uh, it's always been tough for young people. I know it's always tough. It's it always tough. It's, and it's getting loans for their business. Mm -hmm. that, that's the tough part. Um, but through hard work and the internet, because the internet is spawning a lot of uh, excellent businesses of getting their products to the market, mm -hmm. and so on. So it, it always has been tough. But for but for some good ideas and hardworking kids, uh, it's an excellent option for this country to encourage that um, career path, if you will. It's not for everyone. Okay, let me do one. We've got about three, four minutes left here. I want to put one more thing on the table. My hunch is, and I don't know, Craig, you first on this. My hunch is there are discussions about this subject at tables which have at them representatives from the federal government, the provincial government, labor, the education sector. Is there some kind of table where everybody sits around and says, we've got to figure this out? And if they are doing that, how come they're not doing better? Well, I have to be honest. I'm not aware of a specific group that's you know coordinating that sort of discussion. Do we need that? I, I think that there is broad-based awareness that 
that jobs are, are, are important and that young people are disproportionately hurt by the environment that, that we're currently in. Um, but the, the simple reality is that you know, if, if things improve oh, you know, outside of Canada, it, I, I would argue that actually from a fiscal point of view, it's actually more important what happens in terms of the US fiscal policy and what happens in Europe than actually what happens in, in Canada. Because if you actually have an improvement in, in business sentiment, as we've talked about, then you are actually going to have quite a sharp reaction in terms of money getting put to work and jobs being created. And from a government point of view, I mean, there, most governments, I would agree with the conversation we've had, most governments are actually focused on how do we rebalance our finances. Um, but like I said, you know, you have to still try to, at the end of this, have a competitive dynamic economy. You have to create opportunity. I would agree actually that we actually need more venture capital. You know, in terms of, and this isn't just for young people, just in, in, general, in general, to have a to have a more productive economy, we need more venture capital. Doug Anderson, do we need some kind of multi-partite table discussion where representatives from, you know, all of the important institutions in our society that can create jobs get around a table and figure out how to do it? Well, I'd certainly be interested to uh, to see what they discuss and and whether they can come up with some sort of consensus. Uh, so uh, I don't know of one like that and, uh, and would be very interested in seeing uh, what goes on. One thing I'd like to toss out, though, is that the, in my experience, the research that we've done among private sector decision makers about uh, you know, hiring and prospects is that, uh, as Craig said, there's, there's a lot of prudence. And right now, caution is the word. And uh, it's uh, perhaps cold comfort if, um, if what we have in Canada is uh, a group of companies, uh, you know, private sector that actually has great potential and is sitting on some uh, wealth that hasn't been allocated towards, uh, you know, hiring and innovation and uh, um, expansion. But that is ultimately what they're going to want to do. That is how they're going to grow their own prospects. And companies will want to be uh, using that money to get a return on it. And uh, from what I understand and from what I would expect will occur uh, is what, where that money ends up, although not in the very, very short term, is uh, hiring you know, our smart, young Canadian talents, our entrepreneurs, our uh, graduates, our tradespeople, uh, and expanding the businesses uh, once they feel comfortable with the investment. The, the problem is that it's, it's probably not going to occur in the very short term. Okay. Doug, you get the last word on this today. Thanks, everybody, very much for your participation in our conversation. Uh, Doug Anderson, the Senior Vice President for Harris Decima in Ottawa. That's him on the right. Andrew Jackson, uh, Chief Economist for the Canadian Labour Congress, also in Ottawa on the left. Craig Alexander, Senior Vice President, Chief Economist, TD Bank Financial Group. Nancy Schaefer, President, Youth Employment Services. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Andrew Langell, the Employment Law Lawyer here in Toronto. Thanks very much, everybody. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.